Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is Martin Willis, and I'm your host. And uh, we have Chris Christopher O'Brien on the show this evening. He's really here this time. I, I, I got to <laughs> tell you about last time now. Uh, last time he slept, uh, he, he overslept, uh, didn't didn't set his alarm or slept through his alarm or whatever. But, you know, I mean, there was a reason for that. Um, he's doing he's doing well. Everything is just fine. And he's here tonight. And uh, that actually kind of worked out in a way, because uh, thanks to the YouTube listeners out there, uh, we had a call in show, an unexpected one that um, I, I can't believe the amount of email that I received and um, people saying, do that again. <laughs> so uh, so it started something. At least I'm going to give it another try. I'm going to give it an official try. Um, and that will be on St. Patty's Day. And I hope people don't drink too much of the green beer before they call. Uh, but that's on March 17th, I believe that date is. So I'll announce that ahead of time so you can get your questions ready or your UFO stories ready or whatever it is. We'll have a uh, race, as always, does the call screening over here. Great, I'm grateful for that um, at KGRA Radio. He'll be uh, doing that and uh, checking people as they uh, as they call in for that. Again, that's March 17th. Um, uh, we have a blog up on our website, uh, podcastufo.com, and check that out. I think it's a it's one of my favorite um, incidences, and that is the uh, Father Gill case, and. Uh, it's about Father Gill and UFOs, and, and the, our blogger, Charles Lear, uh, actually uncovered a couple of things that I had never heard about uh, when he was doing some research for this. And Father Gill, I don't know if anyone's ever looked into that. There's Also, I posted on in the middle of the blog um, a video of him talking about the event. He didn't really use the fact that you know he was a man of the cloth, so to speak, um, to promote his authenticity he just said if you don't believe me that's okay and uh check out the video it's really great i wish i could have met him he passed away years ago but um another really great case that has happened an unexplained one and an interacting one actually there were no. some uh there was a flashlight i think they waved at it and the, it seemed like the beings were uh, interacting uh and they're standing on top of the craft it, it's a real bizarre story so uh check that out a lot of people um Ironically, I think it's ironic, but there's a number of people that listen to my Antique Auction Forum podcast that actually listen to this show, too. And I actually, usually it's the people that listen to my UFO shows will, uh, they will, uh, you know, maybe wander over to the Antique Auction Forum and listen to those podcasts over there. But I've actually had it go the other way around the other day. I had an email from someone, a longtime listener to my Antique show that said he was looking, wondering why I wasn't having new shows on my antiques, and he found the UFO show. <laughs> and he said, it's fascinating. I never really thought about it, but he says, I'm listening all the time. So um, I'm, I'm kind of grateful for that. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to start doing more of those uh, shows, uh, and I'm going to be at a car museum next week working, uh, doing a show over there as well, Antique Cars, so that ought to be fun. Uh, for now... I do want to thank everyone that helps out with the show, and uh, there's a lot of people behind the scenes. I'm, I'm grateful for all that, and uh, I also uh, want to thank Race at uh, KGRA Radio for the great job he does, and uh, and uh, Peggy, who helps out with the Facebook page, and a number of people have been asking me constantly every single week, you know, is Alejandro okay, Alejandro Rojas, uh, what's up with him, what's going on? Um, I don't really know... Um, to be honest with uh, the people out there, I really don't know if um, if he's planning on coming back. I really don't know. He he may have you know changed a few things uh, with what he wants to do for right now. I can't answer for him. I'm trying to give him his uh, privacy. His you know it is a, a, a private thing for him. Uh, whatever he does, so he doesn't really want me to discuss too much on what's going on. But um, Every single week I get a lot of people wondering and they're worried about him. But I can tell you this, you don't have to worry about him. He is doing fine, and we've had some great uh, conversations. It's just that he, I, I just don't know what his uh, future is as far as being on this show. Um, as far as me replacing him with someone else, I don't know if I'm going to do that either. Uh, I may not. I may just continue like this. I do personally miss the news updates, you know, on the shows the way they were. I just... It's, 
uh, I, I'm usually too busy during the week to check on things and how they're going. So that that's always been helpful for me um, when he fills me in on that. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I may figure out something at a later time. But for right now, uh, you just got little old me here. And I, I do appreciate everyone that listens. And I do appreciate everyone that supports the show as well. And for now, I'm going to introduce our guest, Christopher O'Brien. Uh, he doesn't really need much of an uh doesn't need much of an introduction. He's been on many times, but uh, he's got an incredible background, wrote the best book out there on cattle mutilations. A uh, really great one. I've read through quite a bit of it. It's a big book. It's a great book. It is the top-notch, uh, top-notch work on that subject. Uh, we're going to be talking about all kinds of different things tonight. And uh, Chris, I consider Chris uh, a friend. Uh, he actually stayed at my guest house um, a few years ago before I sold my house up on the mountain there and uh we went out uh chris uh remember going out on the boat how can you forget that right <laughs> right <laughs> that didn't last too long <laughs> we we got well, stranded yeah and, in the middle of the lake <laughs> in the middle of the lake and you saved the day i remember you uh doing your pirate or whatever and waving uh life preservers and someone actually it was a pretty lonely day on the lake out there remember that there was only yeah. like one boat a mile mm -hmm. away and <laughs> right, and came and rescued us. But uh, yeah, yeah, good times. But anyway, uh, <laughs> welcome to the show, and I'm glad you're Thanks. doing okay. And everybody else, uh, hey, a lot of people were concerned about you uh, when you didn't show up the last time. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I I think I booked the uh, the show a little too soon after a, a you know, fairly uh, well. Let's put it this way: we, anytime you get heart surgery, it's uh, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Um, it was a fairly fairly routine procedure. Um, unfortunately, I developed um, arterial fibrillation a year ago, and um, this is a new procedure that's only been around for I don't know about 15 years, um, where they actually go up your uh, carotid artery and go through your heart and then oblate the nerve bundles that uh, kick off the. Uh, the you know the heartbeats that, that uh, the fibrillating heartbeats and so um, I was still kind of down and out uh, and um, when I went to sleep I I I didn't set my alarm and uh, uh, I just I just kept sleeping and uh, unfortunately I missed, missed the show I really felt bad I think I woke up at about eight o'clock and I went oh no <laughs> that's right that's right it was pretty but, funny but I'm, like I'm, back. I'm back I'm yeah. back yeah, I'm back and uh, I'm I'm doing really good and uh, I've got lots of cool stuff been going on and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, getting out of the uh, New York upstate New York uh, weather here. We just yeah. had about a foot of snow and <laughs> it's uh, you know uh, it gets old after a few months, um, especially yeah. you know living in Arizona for so many years. Uh, it's a little new and different. My cat doesn't like me anymore. She, uh, <laughs> She she was born in the desert and uh, yeah. she she just takes one step outside and just looks at me and goes meow. Yes, I, I did that. I lived in California for nine years and came back with a chihuahua that was not happy walking in yeah. the snow, just like exactly. A, yeah, I got the look like what is this? Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, but uh, you're working on all kinds of things as usual. You yeah. you're not the type of guy that rests on his laurels so. Uh, uh, no. Yeah. So tell us what you're up to these days. Well, you know, we've got uh, the UFO DAP project, which is the UFO detection uh, um, data acquisition uh, project. And uh, basically what we've been doing for 12 years is coming up with an affordable and, um, you know, an all, you know, a, a state of the art, really, uh, an affordable system that, you um, will detect um, aerial anomalies and um, basically there's triangulated cameras with um, a multi-sensor pack that's uh, based on a raspberry pi, pi and and it's got a magnetometer uh, an accelerometer and um, you know complete atmospheric uh, information and and it's all tied into gps so uh, you're able to triangulate um, get the altitude azimuth and speed and and um, 
hopefully at some point we're also going to be able to, to uh, detect uh, varying degrees of luminance. And then we'll also find out whether the object is um, in some way impacting the Earth's magnetic field and whether um, it's, um, you know, got some sort of gravitational component. And we've got our first system that uh, after, uh, many years of investigative work. Um, it's in South Central Colorado. And then this spring, I'm going back back there and we're going to put in the other two cameras and the multi-sensor uh, package. So I'm really, really excited about it. And we've already been um, um, selling uh, uh, the product. It, uh, we're not really doing this to make money. Everything is pretty much at cost. And um, so we've um, sold one to a guy that is setting it up this spring right next door to the Skinwalker Ranch up there in Utah. Oh. And then we have interest in, uh, uh, we've got a guy that's in northern uh, Utah with a system, um, a doctor with a, um, a camera uh, in San Pedro, which is the southernmost part of L.A. He's right on the beach. And we have interest uh, from Switzerland and Australia and Italy. And we're um, we're pretty excited because the... Um, the systems are, you know, anybody can can afford it. It's not like it was when I first started working on uh, the idea 12, 15 years ago. It would have cost, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars um, because the technology has has come down in price and gone up in quality. And, and uh, uh, these types of um, systems are now attainable. And what makes our system really unique is it has customized software that detects motion and then tracks the motion and um, sends a signal over the internet to the other cameras so that they can wheel around and uh, with coordinate data then go ahead and get a second and third camera angle on on the event. So this is the kind of information that um, if we're able to replicate it, we could literally write a scientific paper um, with the help of a credentialed scientist, um, a physicist. And um, this would be kind of the holy grail, really, for uh, scientific ufology is to be able to get the kind of data that um, is then replicated and then uh, presented for peer review. And and this is a, a dream come true. I, I often joke, you know, people say, call me a ufologist. And I say, please <laughs> do not call me one of those uh, people. Uh, and they say, well, uh, you do investigate them. I said, yeah. And if I was a ufologist, I'd be coming up with a system like UFODAP. So um, take that for what it's worth. Um, and that's just one of uh, several projects that um, that we have going right now. Uh, that that particular one is the most exciting, I think, uh, in terms of uh, the impact that it'll have. I think on the field. Yeah, people can spend anywhere from four hundred to five thousand dollars, and uh, and have a on you know self-contained uh, detection system that uh, will allow them uh, the ability to uh, you know, like I said, um, actually uh, gather scientific data of of uh, anomalous aerial object events. So that's that's one thing that I'm working on. Um, now, before we get into that, I know uh, Ray uh, Ray Stanford's listening now. Uh, hopefully, he'll call in later. Um, it, it seems like he, he just uh, sent me an email right now saying we're having audio cut in and out, and uh, I'm trying to uh, see if that is the case. Uh, Can you hear me it, all right there? I hear you perfectly here, uh, but okay. I guess it has been cutting in and out. I'm not really sure why. We have a great signal, but uh, it is what it is is and we'll we'll just move on but uh ray ray you know think of the money he had to spend back in the late 1970s oh my god yeah well he was my inspiration really for this uh you know project starlight his program back in the early 70s was uh in 1970 uh 71 i think or 72 it was um well over a million dollars in fact i think with the land and stuff that they had there outside of austin it was around two million dollars that uh they had to uh, to sink into the project and and now we can do with much better technology we can do all that for hundreds of dollars as opposed to you know seven figures uh so uh but but that whole concept of hard data um you know gathering actual hard data um i was really inspired by by ray's work 
uh, who he was decades and decades ahead of his time. And, uh, and, you know, again, I, um, tip my hat to a lot of, uh, hard work that uh, went into that particular effort. And, uh, Ray is going to be, uh, if he, <laughs> if he wants, he can be one of our, or my, our, my chief analysts. So when we get some good stuff, we'll let Ray chew on it for a while. And, uh, and tell us if we got something worthy or not. He's uh, the best in in the field at um, analyzing these events, uh, especially photographic and and um, you know other evidence. Ah, uh huh. Yeah, uh, yeah. I that's that's really great. Um, and these things I saw. I tried to put up a, a picture of of the. Uh, the unit itself, um, and I can't get it. It wants to turn sideways in the software for some reason. So I was going to show that to everyone. Um, is this, uh, was this your brainchild all the way through? Did you have a lot of people? Well, no, no, there's, there's a team of people that have been involved. Um, Wayne Holland back, my, my, my principal who, uh, I've been work I worked with for 12 years. Unfortunately, he uh, passed away last year and, and that just left, Myself and Ron Olch, who's our engineer. Ron's really the brains behind the um, the software and and then matching the uh, the gear with the software. He's the engineer and computer scientist. I basically am the cheerleader, ah. <laughs> and uh, and I helped uh, you know I help install the systems and then do the some of the analytical work. Um, I've been taking notes uh, from Mr. Stanford for years, and and I'm getting a little better at uh, at determining. You know what what things are, and um, of course on the internet, uh, 98 percent, 99 percent of what you see is is uh, not what it's uh, purported to be. So um, yeah. it's always it's always fun to try to come up with the proper explanation, then send it to Ray and and see if he'll confirm it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah, so it's it, it was a three person project, and now we're down to two and. And um, we also are, we haven't really joined forces with another group, but um, as soon as we do, I'll be able to make an announcement on that. We have uh, some some pretty pretty interesting um, inquiries about uh, combining efforts with other other teams. And uh, well, that's great. once we have something yeah. to announce, yeah, we will. Yeah, that that's really great. And I, uh, I have mentioned that uh, to other people that have uh, have had uh, similar. Um, you know, not really units, but, you know, you mentioned uh, someone earlier, and uh, uh, I've mentioned to uh, Mark D'Antonio and a few other different people that are trying to do something, you know, we're all trying to do the same thing, get the same answer, and it would be great if uh, people did, yeah. uh, uh, instead of compete, if that's what it is, uh, yeah. you know, to to uh, combined, uh, combine efforts and, and try to uh, get some more answers. So, yeah. 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 Well, Mark's um, he's listed um, on our website as a consultant uh, for astronomical questions and for analytical uh, work. Um, we would lo love to get Mark, uh, you know, as much involved as he's willing to. Um, of course, uh, mm -hmm. it's you know, again, we really want to um, make this uh, system um, available for as, as many people as 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 possible because. Once we start producing data, um, we'll be able to really start crunching some numbers and doing pattern recognition and and uh, you know looking for commonalities and looking for uh, you know that <laughs> holy grail of scientific research and that's repeatability and uh, and that's uh, you know we need to get uh, systems out there and we need good anal analyzing uh, going on after the data has been gathered. So Mark is. Uh, is one of a number of people that we've invited to be uh, to be involved. Um, Jacques Vallée kind of helped out a little bit, gave us some ideas on some things to consider. Uh, and we've also had, like I said, Ray has has, um, has been, um, you know, sort of pointing things out and, and uh, making suggestions. And, you know, it's it's three steps forward, two steps back, like everything in life. And, uh, you know, when, when it's all being done, on the uh, on the cheap, so to speak, uh, it's hard to get things done sometimes. But um, I think we have a lot of nice forward momentum now, and and um, you know we've uh, uh, been approached by Kevin Day, 
um, who yeah. of course was the radar operator on the USS Princeton during the uh, the Nimitz Tic Tac event. And he's going to be mounting an expedition to Catalina Island there off the coast of uh, California. And then later on, the following year, he's going down to Guadalupe, which is in the area where they had the uh, Tic Tac event. And we're going to be uh, helping out with some gear. And and um, I think uh, he's expecting at least one of us to go along. I have good sea legs, so I wouldn't mind. <laughs> It'd be kind of fun. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> hey, what about uh, Peter Davenport's, you know, his passive radar um, idea uh, that that yeah. seemed like it was a uh, pretty pretty solid yeah um actually i have an active radar idea <laughs> oh really um, okay yeah yeah no, and take a marine radar stick it on a pedestal that is being fed coordinate data so it'll um, you know pan and tilt uh according to um you know where the actual gps uh signal is pointing it and um, you put a, a marine radar unit on it, you dampen uh, the signal, uh, the 350 degrees of the sweep of the radar unit, and then have a window that's pointed right at the event, and you could sit there and paint it and uh, get a return. They're good up to about 40 miles line of sight. So wow. um, uh, the San Luis Valley, where our first system is going in, is radar invisible below 18,000 feet. We could probably get away with it for a while. Um, there is no radar in the valley. The only problem is if our if our detection equipment detects an F-16 zipping down the Levita uh, military operations, uh, you know, MTR, military training route, um, I, I think the pilot would probably end up soiling his drawers and all of a sudden he gets painted <laughs> oh jeez! Radar. Never thought of that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we only uh, so, have. A... You know, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, so we need to check into the, the legality uh, of doing a, an active radar. Passive radar would be good too, uh, especially on a uh, a slaved plat platform like that. Uh, it would be. Um, it would be. Again, it's just another tool. You know, it gives you another. Another set of information. It gives you, you know, real accurate uh, distance uh, information. Yeah, uh, we have to go into break in like uh, two minutes. But um, you know, prior to that, I'd like to at least begin uh, talking about the San Luis Valley, uh, just mm -hmm. because um, uh, we do have a lot of new listeners to the show and a lot of new listeners right. that are not uh, are, are just like new to the UFO topic. So, right. uh, well, if you can fill fill in like. For the person just listening for the first time, uh, what kind of hot spots are there are in including the San Luis Valley? Yeah, uh, we yeah. might have to save that for when we come back from the break because we're coming yeah. right up to it. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, we'll do that when we get back. Um, I'll go ahead and give them a, a thumbnail sketch of um, the, the actual valley and the 25 years of work that I've been doing there. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to head into break. Uh, this is Martin Willis, and we'll be right back, right back, right after these messages. We're clear, gentlemen. Four minutes in this break. All right. Excellent. Except, uh, guess what, Chris? Um, what? I didn't tell you this, but we're still live on YouTube. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, good thing you uh, you held your time. I forgot time. about that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so, uh, you say you're out in New York. Uh, so we'll just talk about, yeah. we'll, we'll get back to the San Luis Valley when we come back. Right. But uh, mm -hmm. you're in uh, New York. Have you uh, paid attention? I mean, there's that's there's a lot of activity in upper state New York, or there yeah. has been. Yeah, there's been some Bigfoot reports. Um, we've had a, a few sighting events, nothing near me. Uh, Cheryl Costa, of course, is just up the road in, uh, I think, Syracuse. And then uh, Richard yeah. Dolan's just up the road in... Uh, rochester and peter robbins is he's pretty close to me he's up by ithaca and uh and then i'm right on the border with uh, pennsylvania or as some people around here call it pencil <laughs> um <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh and of course they've they're they've the northeast corner of the state is uh has been a hotbed of activity uh on and off over the years uh you know north of uh Wilkes-Barre and Scranton, that area, north of there. And uh, I will be... Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, Pine Bush, is that the name of the place I'm thinking of? 
Yeah, that's in New York. Is that is that anywhere right on near off you? the Hudson? Yeah, it's fairly close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was um, you know it's over it's over to the east uh, on the Hudson there or near the Hudson. I think I, it's on the other side of the Hudson actually. Uh, Peggy, that's been helping out for years with our Facebook page. Um, has uh, she used to live in that area and she used to talk about where she's told me stories about getting the lawn chair and like going out. There was all these people would just be sitting there and, and waiting for something to happen. A lot of times it would happen. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. No, I remember talking with uh, Ellen Crystal and Bruce Cornett back in the uh, early 90s. And and then when I lived in uh, Riverdale, uh, there was, um, well, actually I was in Manhattan by the time the wave started, but I had a friend in Riverdale and we go up there and then head north up to Hudson to Untermyer State Park there north of Yonkers back in the uh, mid 80s and early 80s when the when the you know the Hudson Valley sightings were were happening and I I met a number of people and had a couple of friends that actually had really good sightings uh, and so I was always jealous because I, whenever I would go out nothing would happen and and then I you know invariably somebody would call up and say wow you wouldn't believe what we saw the other night so you know it's just mm. my luck I guess back then uh, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I never did get to see anything. In chat, someone wanted to know what brought you to upstate New York. A friend, well, right? I've, uh, yeah, my friend Fritz, who I have known 40, 40 plus years, he uh, he was kind of undergoing a health crisis and uh, and was you know needed a little uh, some help and and I came and kind of did a little med medical intervention and <laughs> mm -hmm. got him some care. He'd never been to a doctor in his life and he really, you know, he needed to, uh, needed to be, uh, needed somebody to intervene medically for him. And so, uh, he's doing much, much better. He was not in good shape when I first arrived here a year ago. I remember. It's been almost two years. Yeah. 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 We had the conversation. So yeah, I was glad to hear that he's doing really well. Yeah, much better. Yeah, yeah. And you did a really good thing by doing that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, living in the desert about every 13, 14 years, I need a couple of years break, <laughs> you know, get off, get out of the desert, get get into a place that's a little bit... Uh, oh, here we a go. Bit better weather. Yeah, going back. We're ready to go back, gentlemen. You bet. Martin, I got a guy in the chat room. A KGRA? Yep. He says you look like Richard Dreyfus. <laughs> I think that's a compliment. Richard Dreyfus. Yeah, I think that's a compliment. I'll, I'll take it, it as one. I think it is, too. <laughs> when you took your hat off and your glasses, <laughs> I was like, hey, he does. He really does. Oh, okay, no. here we go, guys. Yeah. And we're right on time at 1629.30 in five, four, three, two. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. My guest tonight is Chris O'Brien. And before we went into break, we were talking about the San Luis Valley in Colorado. Um, it's Is it down near Four Corners, Chris? It is considered the northeast corner of ah. the Four Corners. Oh, okay. So it is, yeah. 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 It's the um, it's a world's largest alpine valley. It's in right above the border with New Mexico, and it actually goes below uh into uh, new mexico and down to taos and it's about 130 miles long 60 70 miles wide it's football shaped completely ringed by mountains um the valley sits the valley floor is at 7600 feet and then the mountains go up to 14 a lot of them and um it's i think arguably uh has a variety and intensity of unexplained events uh, that I've yet to find a, another place that rivals it. Um, some people think Sedona is, is, has more activity, but it really doesn't, uh, relatively speaking. Um, back in the early 90s, they did a, the Computer UFO Network did a, a uh, per capita rating of um, hotspot areas in the country for UFO sightings. And the San Luis Valley was 271 sightings uh, per 10,000 population. The next nearest wow. uh, was Bucks County, which is 57. Uh, Jeez. I, I, I estimate that one in 50 
UFO sightings are reported. Um, people actually have become used to them, and it's not that big of a deal. So people see stuff all the time there. I had dozens of sightings in the 13 years I was there, including some daylight sightings that were just amazing. One little sh scout ship that was 150 feet away from me flew right in front of our car uh, as we were driving. Um, it's the variety, intensity, and intensity of unexplained occurrences there is just it's just <laughs> it's jaw dropping. I mean, pretty much any type of UFO craft um, that has been reported you'll at some point somebody will see it um all the all the different colored um orbs from the real big green fireballs to the small ruby red uh balls that zip around and uh the orange ones that are medium size and then a little smaller the the um you know the kind of incandescent uh to yellow um we have uh fields of lights that light up that nobody's been able to figure out what they are there's thousands of lights that'll light up a whole hillside blinking on and off like like um lightning bugs or fireflies um and then bigfoot and other crypto creatures elementals uh small little diminutive uh type creatures that you normally associate with with celtic countries um what do you mean by uh, elementals yeah. Um, trooping fairies, um, little guys with green outfits on and sunburned faces. It, it, it's just some of the reports are just mind blowing. Um, and coming from really good experts or, or uh, uh, good witnesses, uh, people that are above, above, you know, suspicion or reproach, including a world class, you know, one of the most famous musicians in the world. And he was in his studio, and he uh, he saw a movement out of the corner of his eye, and coming through the closed door was a line of, he said they're about eight or nine inches tall, and he says there are about seven or eight of them, and they came through the door, and in a line, they marched right, right by him, <laughs> two feet away, and then disappeared uh, in the wall of his, uh, through the wall of his studio. He said they were dressed in little robes and had these tall like keystone cop hats on and he said um they all went through the wall and then the last one stopped and it turned around and it looked at him and gave him a dirty look and then turned around and walked, <laughs> walked through the wall. i'm not making God. this up and and he 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 had seen other things around his house and he he just he was too embarrassed to call me but he said after that he says i I know you're gonna think I'm totally nuts, and and you know he didn't drink, he didn't do drugs, he was a no mushrooms, umpteenth, no, yeah, wow. no mushrooms. Uh, you know he's a a really spiritual guy, he's a black, you know, umpteenth black belt in karate, and had uh, forty patents. He had the patent for the electronic guitar. Uh, was a keyboard wow. player on the Star Trek theme and on all the Golden Age of Television stuff. Six hundred film and TV credits. Um, not a lightweight and not somebody that you would, uh, you know, think was going to be trying to, you know, hallucinate some a weird experience like that. And it came on the heels of a bunch of stuff that had been happening around his house. And uh, it just so happens he happens to live by some sort of portal or doorway to some other realm. It's right over the hill from his house. That I was able to finally, after years of pinning it down, I was able to ID the actual spot. Talk about a place to put some gear. That would be, oh man, I would love to put some gear there. Boy, that that is but, uh, that is that's one of the strangest stories I've, yeah. ever, I've ever heard. Yeah, I know, I know. It's it's, it's yeah. just bizarre. Why do you think there are locations? You just mentioned a portal, a possible portal, whatever right. you just said. But why do you think there are locations where there are hot spots and and <clears throat> you know all these? Uh, there, it's not unusual that there's other things besides UFOs and what is a UFO hotspot? Yeah. Well, I have a little formula that if you you can uh, say these five things about a place, it's going to be a hotspot area. It's a place that's uh, held as sacred to the indigenous people of the area. A place that has sacred sites that go back into prehistory, 
a place that has ebbing and flowing waves of unusual activity, not just one thing, but but multiple things. Um, it's also a place that has uh, uh, unusual geophysical properties, whether it's uh, uh, like in the case of the San Luis Valley, uh, minimum and maximum magnetic field strength butted up against one another in close proximity. And also in the case of the valley and, and also like places like Wilshire and England, you have alternating layers of water, clay, and sand, which creates almost like a natural battery. Um, I, I really have a sense uh, that um, veins of quartz, um, there's tons of quartz in the Sangre de Cristos. In fact, on super cold, dry uh, winter nights, uh, it's pretty rare. I've only seen it once or twice, but you can see the, the actual cold uh, electricity uh, grounding from the quartz in the mountains going up into the atmosphere. And um, so there's a lot of uh, quartz there. Uh, and usually an area like this will have a military or government presence. And oftentimes the government's trying to expand their presence further into the area to get more control um, of the area. Um, so if you have those five things, chances are you're going to have a place like Sedona or around Mount Shasta in other, mm -hmm. other spots in the Pacific Northwest, Pine Bush, uh, White Sands down in New Mexico. There's some really cool places in, in Idaho and in Montana. Um, there's places all, all up and down the Ohio River Valley where um, your mound culture used to be located. Oftentimes, those mounds are on sites that uh, that have that those five elements involved. So. That's kind of a, a formula that um, you can use, and um, it's 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 interesting when when things are going to happen in the San Luis Valley. We see these things I call cheap fireworks. They're like giant bottle rockets that fizzle out, and um, I've seen them below me in altitude, complete uniform overcast sky, and the thing arched over uh, uh, Spanish Creek, which is lined with trees, and it was just dark enough so that you could see the light from the object was actually illuminating the tops of the trees. These cheap fireworks tend to happen at the beginning of a wave of activity. And then, boom, we'll have UFO reports, we'll have, you know, crypto sightings. Um, one year it was flying humanoids. We had a whole <laughs> flurry of sightings. Um, it's some of these undulating uh, forms that I call prairie dragons that people see, they think, you know, they usually see them out of the corner of their eye, and so they don't really pay attention. But I was actually see, looked right at one, and it, it went right in front of me. Um, then uh, when the wave is over in a matter of days or a week or a month, then you'll have uh, more cheap fireworks that kind of indicate the end of the, of the cycle. Um, so, you know, once you've been in an area like I was there for, you know, doing full as full-time investigating as I could, you start to, uh, if you're writing everything down, uh, you can start to determine that there are some patterns uh, within the data and that you can you can almost see um, how things kind of unfold in an area like the San Luis Valley. And there there is a what appears to be a sequence of events that ushers in and ushers out um, a wave. And um, I, I really do feel that the San Luis Valley is arguably the has the m most variety and intensity of unexplained uh, um, occurrences anywhere in North America. I, I have not heard of a place that um, has more and um, and intense too. I, I've had, in, in the middle of a wave, I had 17 phone calls in one day, about five separate events. Hmm. Um, just to give you an idea <laughs> wow. how, how active it can be. Yeah, how about that? Um, you know that I've been to Four Corners and I've, I've been up to the Shasta a lot. When I lived out in California, I would uh, go up uh, to this lake area up there, um, Siskiyou, Siskiyou, whatever Sisi. it is. Yeah, Siskiyou. Uh, yeah, Sisi yeah, it's the county, too. Yeah. Um, so I would go there quite a bit. And uh, I do remember, uh, I definitely remember feeling there was, like, I wanted to get out of Four Corners when I went there, that area. Uh, I, something felt really it felt really weird. And this is before I was looking into UFOs um, at all. Right. This was many years ago. Yeah. Same thing with Shasta. There were a few areas up there that I just had just a strange feeling. Nothing else. I didn't see anything. Uh, right. Nothing like that. But uh, but I do hear there's a lot. Uh, 
you know, since I moved out of that area, I heard there is a lot in, in Shasta. And I've never really heard of any main incident. Are you aware of any, you know, incident or is it just like things you're talking about? It's, it's just, I mean, if you look at uh, some of the stories of the Wintu and, and other natives in the area and then equate it to some of the, the events that have uh, been reported down through the years, it, it, again, it ebbs and flows and it's fairly consistent there. Um as well as around Mount Adams. The, the big volcanoes, uh, for some reason, tend to have this kind of activity. Mount St. Helens, uh, uh, Mount Rainier, uh, those big mountains there along the, uh, the Cascade Range and the, uh, the Pacific Coast Mountains, uh, uh, you know, do have a lot of very interesting stuff going on. Uh, I can't really think of anything offhand course you have your your apocryphal stories of the the white robed uh, white haired tall kind of nordic looking uh uh hitchhikers that uh s- some people claim live inside mount shasta and of course they do in uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey hey uh, uh, someone just posted something on on we have to go to break and now i'd like to let's see how many minutes looks like seven minutes so um I do want to get into this subject a little bit, and I wondered if you looked into it. I think uh, last time you were going to be on, we we briefly talked about it or mm-hmm. passed an email about it. The drones, the drone situation out there in yeah. Colorado. Have have you looked into that at all? Yeah, and a friend of mine is really doing some major digging on that. There's there's something going on there. Maybe some sort of espionage. It may have something to do with the Chinese. Evidently, the um, the U.S. has now uh, put a moratorium on any Chinese drone sales, and I, I have a real strong hunch that uh, there may be a connection. Um, if you look at a map of where the drone events are being reported, and then look a map at a map of the the missile fields of our ballistic missile sites in Wyoming, Montana, uh, Nebraska, and Colorado, it's in the same area. It may be some sort of systematic, uh, you know. I guess it would be espionage. <laughs> uh, that's that's about as close as I can get. It's also the hardest hit area uh, back in the '70s for cattle mutilations. Oh, so yeah. Um, that that is a subject I did want to talk a little bit about. But um, but wasn't weren't there reports of the actions of these drones uh, or some characteristics about them that where people were saying, well, that that doesn't sound like a drone, or have you? In, any part of that you've have you heard about well yeah some of them are pretty large from what i understand that they were uh, the real big ones and and they don't have the high pitch whine that the uh, the smaller ones like the phantoms and the um you know the smaller drones do they have a, a deeper a deeper sound because the engines are bigger mm-hmm. so um you know and this is one group ufo group i think they came forward and claimed that it was them and i, I think they were just looking for publicity uh this was a real ex, ex, you know extensive uh flight program uh, that somebody w- was you know enacting uh it was there was a lot of activity and and uh it it, it sounds like either some big corporation or the government or maybe even another uh like i said it could be the chinese the Russians, who knows? Uh, I haven't really dug into it that much, um, but I have a friend who's really digging into it, and he's he's been uncovering some pretty interesting stuff that he's going to do an article or something at, at some point um, about it. It seems to have dropped off. I haven't heard very much about it in the last three weeks or so. Right. So I'm not sure if those sightings are continuing or, and we're just not hearing about them or, or they've, they've actually uh, subsided. I wonder if anyone, uh, I believe I read that someone did ask if there was any military, you know, side of this. And they said, no, the, there was nothing uh, the military was involved in, um, you know, but again. No, that's, that's not true because there were waves of drones and then other drones would come and chase the other drones. So there there were what appeared to be confrontations drone on drone. So wow, um, that. Yeah, you you don't hear much about that, but you know if these things are flying into restricted airspace uh, around missile silos, you know there's going to be some sort of military or government response. Yeah, right. Um, I don't know what I was thinking about time. We still have about nine minutes left. I said seven minutes about five minutes ago. Uh, I'm not good at math tonight. 
But, uh, wow. Um, so, yeah, you haven't heard about anything happening with them lately. And uh, so so maybe it's something that won't occur again. But but um, I, I know people, there are some people that are really looking for answers and, and want to know what it is, what's going on. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever been in that area, but it's, it's really the middle of nowhere. Where is it exactly again? Well, it's right where Nebraska, um, Colorado, and you know, kind of Wyoming and Montana come together. There, it's so it'd be um, south western uh, Nebraska, northeastern Colorado, yeah, or uh, um, northeastern uh, Nebraska. Oh, wait a minute, I'm getting confused. It's right up there in the quarter of of Colorado, Weld County, and then over the Platte River. Uh, into Nebraska and then I think into uh, Wyoming. And that's right where all the missile fields are. So it's right around the missile fields. That is interesting. Interesting. Well, um, yeah, yeah, we may not know much about that. So uh, the cattle mutilations. Now, um, you just mentioned a, a few minutes ago that um, and the area in particular was where there was a lot of cattle mutilations. Yeah, yeah, quite a number, hundreds. Hundreds, and uh, yeah. and you are the guy when it comes to that. Um, uh, remind me, stalking the herd is that the name of your book? Correct. Yeah. Uh, when did that uh, come out? How how long? I know we've talked about it on the show before, but again, there's a lot of new mm -hmm. people. Um, yeah. How long did it take you to put that book together? And why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, I. It's probably my least favorite thing to do in life is is uh, investigate dead rotting cows um <laughs> it, it's it, it really was not pleasant but because back in the 90s we had so many cases that were being reported and nobody was really looking into them uh that i kind of got caught up in in the intrigue of thousands of pounds of physical evidence you know <laughs> and uh you know it's the only supposed paranormal phenomenon that leaves behind you know thousands of pounds of evidence um, and that part of it just was very uh, hard to ignore and um, the ranching community really was in need of, of somebody to to at least you know look into it and try to come up with, with some answers and um, by the time I had really gotten going and had I don't know several dozen of them under my belt um, the local sheriff's um, departments realized hey this guy is willing to go there and, and, and do the work and send off uh, forensic samples um, and, and plant and soil samples in a few cases. Uh, I was part of a study. And um, and so they would <laughs> literally kind of call me and have me be the investigator. So I was getting everything right from the police, uh, it, well, sheriff's dispatch and uh, and wow. going out and, and, um, and, you know, helping, trying to, help the ranchers cope with it it's it's very scary uh when you know a good breeding cow is found um with no sign of uh you know cause of death um uh, oftentimes its own tracks aren't even there um sometimes they're in the wrong pasture uh and you know to find soft tissue organs gone uh with uh, the dogs not barking nobody's seeing anything or occasionally lights are seen, or helicopters. Um, this this is really spooky. I mean, number one, the guy's out, you know, anywhere from four hundred to a thousand dollars, even more. Uh, plus, if it's a breeding cow, um, that cow is not going to be having babies for the next uh, four or five years. Uh, so this is a real financial hit on you know these small ranching operations and. Um, uh, you know, somebody, I just felt that somebody, you know, should be looking into this and, uh, I don't care what any of the skeptics say. Some of these cases without question are being perpetrated by someone, uh, with intelligence and with, uh, the aid of sharp cutting implements. Mm -hmm. Um, one, th one thing that, um, you know, I've, I, I literally worked 22 years researching the book and it took me 18 solid months to write it. Uh, wow. I combined all the known databases together. I was the only person that really knew everybody, and well, one exception. And, uh, you know, David Perkins uh, helped me do the research and 
and was instrumental in helping me uh, gain access to the main databases. And this is the first time anyone has really tried to put all the information together in one book and be objective about it and not just, you know, put blinders on and look at five or 10 percent of the data that supports an alien conclusion or look at the cases that support a predator inclusion, you know, mundane scavenger action. Um I, I looked at all the data and I tried to be as objective as, as possible and and non-judgmental and um, you know I, I'm really proud of the book. It's probably what <laughs> I'll be most remembered for. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I good luck trying to top it. I mean, uh, you know, it's right. I'm, I'm real agree. proud of it. Yeah. Um, were there any cases? Of, I've heard this before, and and tell me if you've ever saw a case where it almost appeared as if the cow had been dropped. Yes, many. Many. I've had wow. many. Yeah, at least a dozen, uh, if not more. In fact, uh, we found a pile of uh, three, I think it was three uh, three cows with horns and a horse, and they had been dropped in one pile, and the horns had been snapped off on the bottom side. The ribs had been broken right next to the rib, to the spine. Um, it looked like they'd been dropped from a considerable height. Um, we've had uh, cases of, of cows that appear to have clamp marks on their uh, their rear ends, their back, and um, and the rear legs. Um, we've had cows that um, have their heads twisted around because they've been dropped in in a and landed in an awkward uh, way. Uh, many of these animals do appear to have been dropped from you know a fairly considerable height, and of course. You know, there's been so many helicopter sightings associated with the cases, um, and, and a lot of times the ranchers aren't aren't going to report these things because they know nothing good will come of it. The, mm-hmm. No one's going to come up with an answer. No one's going to be, you know, charging anybody. Uh, all it's going to do is uh, give the rancher unwanted publicity. It'll make him look stigmatized in the community. And so um, generally, I think now um, very few ranchers are reporting them, but the ones that do report them, um, oftentimes they report because they they see helicopters. And, uh, you know, if they see helicopters and they think they're being victimized by their government. uh, And and so that that kind of ticks them off. And and they, they, you know, an angry rancher will be more apt to call uh, and and file a report than a, a rancher who's scared. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, I really do think that there's a, uh, you know, it's maybe one in ten are being reported. I think it's much more pervasive than uh, than you would think. Wow. Uh, we've wow. had cases um, lately in Oregon, uh, which is highly unusual. Anything west of the Rockies is is fairly unusual. We've had cases in central and northern Florida and southern Georgia. Um, there's been cases in Nebraska. Uh, about five or six years ago, we had cases in Missouri. Um, we've had um, possibly some cases in Southern Colorado, but I, I think they're equivocal. I wouldn't I wouldn't count them in the uh, in the totals. But uh, we've had some, had some cases in uh, in Europe. Um, we've had uh, sheep uh, mutilations in uh, in Wales, uh, which is you know the western part of uh, the middle the Midlands in England. Um, did this? Um, was, did this? Uh, we have to go in one minute for for a break. Uh, did this all start with Skippy the horse? Is that what I remember? No, Snippy. But Snippy. no, it started. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it started back in 1605. Is my earliest oh, case. Oh my god! I can find. Oh, all right. Yeah. So we are going into break. So this is a real break. Um, so hang in there. Hang in there, everyone. We'll be right back, uh, right after these messages. My guest this evening is Christopher O'Brien, and before we headed into the break, uh, we were talking about uh, cattle mutilations, and it's a fascinating subject. That Another thing that doesn't make any sense that is happening, mm-hmm. another thing in the real world, I should say, that happens that is so hard to explain, and uh, I, I saw some questions in the chat room, and basically people were asking, what have you ever come up with a conclusion some type of conclusion or what your thoughts are why these say why these things happen well i i, I think 
number one, there there is no hard fast answer. I have a sense that there's multiple groups involved doing this for for different agendas, and they're all kind of interweaving their their uh, agendas with others. And in some cases, to try to throw investigators and law enforcement off their track and and um, and hide their cases in and amongst others. Um, I think there's a multiple um, of things that can be determined. Um, one of the things that I've I've noticed is that well, first of all, you know, beef is the largest income producer in agriculture. In other words, more money is generated through selling beef than any other um, part of the large, you know, agro business. And um, the beef lobby in this country is probably the most powerful lobby that you never hear anything about. Um, except if you're Oprah and you say on, on the air, you're not going to eat another hamburger again and get sued for $2 billion. Um, that, that, that's the only time that you hear about the beef industry or the old Robert Mitchum commercials, beef, it's what's for dinner, right? Mm -hmm. um, the beef industry is incredibly powerful. We slaughter one cow about every second in this country. Wow. Uh, McDonald's alone uh, buys a billion pounds of uh, of beef a year. Um, Unreal. This is a yeah. This is a huge uh, a huge business. And one thing that I, I I do in stalking the herd is I I show in the first chapter how our relationship with cattle has evolved from twelve thousand five hundred years ago when we first started domesticating these giant creatures called aurochs that were the Pregenitor um, species to uh, modern day uh, domestic cows and uh, cattle. And back then we worshiped cows. I mean, it was a big deal. Uh, the bull and the, and the, and the calf and, and stuff. I mean, it's even in the Bible. Uh, Aaron and Moses may have been competing priests and competing cattle cults, for instance. Uh, uh, you don't see reference to cattle too much in the Bible. Uh, James I took out most of the references to cattle in the bible there were there used to be tons of them and uh, isn't it interesting that right when he was uh, beginning that process hundreds and hundreds of sleep uh, sheep rather were being slain around london with their inward parts taken and the meat and the and the the wool was left behind of this sundry conjectures but most would agree it, it tendeth toward fireworks was the quote in the <laughs> in the records of james the first um so you know, we're unceremoniously slaughtering uh, millions of head of cattle, and uh, it's it's a ritual act, but it's it's not done uh, with reverence. Um, that's the difference between um, kosher meat, for instance, and uh, and, uh, and 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 you know the way the uh, some other cultures uh, slaughter animals. Um, it's done with reverence. Um, we're unceremoniously slaughtering animals, and I think what we're doing is we're creating uh, what could be called sort of a uh, kind of a psychic riptide, I think. And um, one thing that I'm fairly certain of is that the beef industry and the government is deathly afraid of mad cow disease all of a sudden appearing in the food chain. And um, uh, I think that um, out of all the overriding potential explanations – um, checking the food chain and, and testing the environment for for uh, one of the worst scourges known to man, uh, the, the prion disease, is, um, I think, one of the main motivators uh, for the mutilations. I, I also think that there's cases that um, uh, may be checking the environment for residual radiation. The areas that uh, tend to be hit the hardest, in North America at least, are areas uh, that had most of the above ground nuclear uh, test site fallout and um, really? that in a combination of copper and um, it makes the animals more susceptible to breaking out with prion disease. All animals have prions in them. It's just, it's like HIV. It kicks off into full blown, um, you know, chronic wasting disease. Um, uh, if, if, uh, if the environmental factors are correct, um, uh, it's it's a really complicated subject, but I have a feeling that those those are probably the main uh, motivations I think behind the uh, 
the modern phase of it. At the core, there is something high strange going on. Um, there are cases that cannot be explained. Those are the cases that people like Linda Howe and Chuck Zukowski and others are really uh, interested in. But they only are about 5 or 10% of the total of cases. Um, the other 90%. Uh, are not done by some high, strange uh, perpetrator, whether it's an alien, whether it's a dimensional, um, you know, <laughs> predator or um, high-tech chefs coming back from the future to harvest illegal cattle parts. Uh, you know, you can come up with all kinds of, of interesting scenarios to explain, excuse me, what the high, te- uh, you know, the the high, strange cases are, but. I think the majority of them are done with sharp scalpels by very, very skilled surgeons uh, who are doing this to test the environment. It's not so much the cow, it's where it is in the environment that's important. And um, stalking the herd goes into all the various explanations, looks at how they started, and then traces the meme into the present day and shows how they all could be uh, possible. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to support each one of these theories, but then there's way more evidence to refute them. <laughs> so wow. uh, yeah. that's why I think we're dealing with something that's multifarious, that uh, it is not one size fits all. Wow. Um, you know, it, you touched on something early uh, when we started talking about this, and that is uh, the lobby. You know, the they have the strongest lobby, and I, I will tell you this. My son is... Uh, has been vegan for I don't know over a year and uh, and he was telling me that there is so much propaganda out there against you know plant-based diets and uh, you know them just uh, saying that uh, you know you'll become frail and unhealthy and and uh, and uh, you know it, it's deadly to be a vegetarian basically and it's and it's supposedly you know propaganda from uh, you know the uh, the meat industry right and uh is that you think that's so yeah it wouldn't surprise me um i i, I don't you know big money um has a lot of power and influence and um i think to counteract the uh, increasing numbers of people that are realizing that beef beef and, and the red meat protein isn't isn't uh healthy um i think obviously they're going to be doing uh, there's going to be some pushback and i think that um he's he's probably right it's not something that you're going to see that's overt i think it's going to be uh it's going to be real kind of underhanded Mm -hmm. (laughs) if you will Mm -hmm. but um you know think about it Uh, there's 1.5 billion cattle on the planet and um that's a lot of cows that's that's if you add it up the weight of that amount of cows they're more than the weight of all the humans on the planet cattle are are really detrimental to the environment and and they're detrimental to human health they're one of the largest sources of of yeah ozone depleting gas methane second largest natural source of uh, methane they're the largest uh, cause of deserts um, because cattle um, really do dig up the environment they're the main reason why we're cutting down the rainforest to make room for more cows um, they also um, are one of the largest freshwater polluters. And whenever we True. have like recalls of spinach because of E. coli and stuff, oftentimes that's a feedlot that's, um, that's you know, somehow contaminated in the groundwater. Um, you know, there's areas in the Gulf of Mexico, off the, uh, you know, North Carolina, areas where we have lots of pig farms and cattle and stuff that are dead areas in the ocean. Um, and... You know, like I said, prion disease, anthrax, rinderpest. I mean, there's a, a whole bunch of diseases that uh, come from cows. And, uh, and you know, it, what is it? 60% of the growth hormone or 80% of the growth hormones that we use in this country go into cattle. 60% of the, or 80% of the antibiotics, 60% of the growth hormones, um, steroids um, go into cows. Um, we wonder why our little girls are going into puberty at eight and nine years old. It's because of all the growth hormones that are in the meat. And, um, you know, I, I, I love beef. Um, I, I don't eat it very much. But when I do, it's grass-fed and it comes from a local source. Mm-hmm. It's not something that, um, you know, I get at Walmart or I get at uh, McDonald's. I will not eat uh, industrialized meat protein. 
Um, it's it's really it's you know at some point it's going to be like playing Russian roulette. We are invariably going to have some sort of uh, you know nasty food chain uh, outbreak and uh, probably. Yeah, I mean, it's just inevitable. Um, it, it, it just seems to be going that way. So, you yeah. know, it, the book is not only about the mystery of cattle mutilations. It's about our our very dysfunctional, um, symbiotic, and almost incestuous relationship with bovines. And uh, one one thing that, that blows people away uh, when I tell them is, is cattle mutilations only happen in Christian countries, <laughs> number one. And, and number two... I have never been able to find a sacred Brahma cow from India that's yeah. been mutilated. I was going to out ask of all you. the millions, <laughs> all the millions of cows yeah. in the, in the world. There's not one Brahma that I've found that's been mutilated, and India has never had a, a cattle mutilation case to my to my knowledge. And uh, they're the largest exporter of beef because they don't eat the cows. <laughs> oh my God! The ex- <laughs> and yeah, so. And wow. there's, but there's McDonald's in India, but they don't they don't serve hamburgers. <laughs> Two hundred ninety, I think McDonald's or something, in India, but they they serve like uh, McAlu and McTandoori <laughs> and you know these kind of. They should serve all that Indian uh, McDonald's food over here. Hell of a lot healthier. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Wow, because I believe in it. It's really gross, but I believe you said there's something like five hundred up to five hundred different cows and one beef patty something ridiculous. well mcdonald's admits that up to 100, oh, 100 could be okay. represented yeah. but um some some people say that as many as a thousand animals could be in one the parts from a thousand animals and if that doesn't make you want to quit mcdonald's nothing will <laughs> well you know again i i don't want to get uh, sued by the beef industry <laughs> and you True. know i'm not yeah. saying don't eat beef i'm just saying be real smart about it and um, eat local mumia, as the Greeks used to call it. Um, you know, um, eat um, you know meat that's that's grown in your region, and uh, make sure it's grass fed and not not from you know some feedlot. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's really an atrocity the way the the animals are treated. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. horrific, just terrible. But um, okay, so that. Uh, that's interesting. We, you know, we're going to take calls in, in about 15 minutes or so. And when we do that, uh, you know, some people may want to bring up some cattle mutilation, um, you know, uh, questions uh, when they when they talk to you. But for right now, let's move on. Let's talk about what you're doing uh, with James Fox. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... Um, I ran into James at the... Uh, uh, I... I guess it was a UFO Congress, and we started talking a bit. And um, I had I had known about his project that he had been working on um, since uh, 2013. He had me out uh, to interview me and and others. Um, uh, pretty much anybody that's uh, anybody in the field uh, was uh, invited out to uh, LA and was interviewed um, on a, a green screen set and. Um, uh, as um, as some of your listeners uh, may know, um, you know I'm 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 real uh, a big fan of Ray Stanford's work, and um, I'm I, I've often said that if he had a fan club, I'd be the president of it. Um, I really do um, do feel that Ray's work is head and shoulders above uh, pretty much anybody in the field, and I I was instrumental in in, in introducing James to to Ray, and you know, I've been kind of keeping tabs on his progress. He's had some real you know, ups and downs over the six years that he's been attempting to do this film called The Phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I ran into him last summer at the um, at the Congress, he he said, look, you know, I'm, I'm right at that point where it would sure be good to have you come out and, and, and check this out and see, you know, just kind of help me, uh, you know, put this baby to bed. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I made a couple of trips out there and and helped him uh, go over and, and fine tune the thing, cut it down from two hours to ninety minutes. Excuse me, actually it was about two hours and fifteen minutes, and um, and helped uh, a little bit on on you know the trailer, uh, uh, you know kind of tweaked a little bit here, tweaked a little bit there. Helped him uh, um, talk with his composer, and um, I, I was really honored uh, that he he asked me to do that and. Um, it was also an honor to be, um, you know, 
one of two people that he trusted to uh, to help him put the thing to bed. The other being Jacques Vallée, and uh, to you know be able to spend some time with Jacques and and work on the uh, on the film was uh, was you know kind of a high point for me, uh, you know professionally. And uh, I must say that um, the thing that's most impressive, uh, besides the fact that James is the only real filmmaker in ufology. Um, there's a lot of people that can slap, you know, stuff together, but nobody that does it with the Elan and and um, and the the elegance that he does. Uh, I'm a huge fan of his work. He's a very talented storyteller. And when I found out that he got a theatrical release, I was just flabbergasted. I don't think right. any UFO film has ever been shown in a movie theater. Nine hundred theaters, right? Nine nine hundred theaters, right? And and It'll go to fifteen hundred if it takes takes off. Um, that is a big deal, and uh, yes, the realization of what people are going to be seeing. Ninety percent of the audience, maybe even more, is going to have maybe a passing interest in UFOs, but they are not going to have very little, if any, knowledge about the history, the modern, of you know, history of UFOs, and so. This movie is not only going to be a crash course in um, the, the whole field of ufology and, and the, the unfolding of cases since 1947, since the Kenneth Arnold sighting, but it also has cases and footage that I've never seen before and that anybody that I've talked to that's seen the film has never seen before. So there's something for everybody. There's something for the, the you know, the cynical jaded uh ufologist <laughs> uh, all the way to the you know 10 year old kid who's just you know interested in the subject but doesn't really have a, a knowledge base so um one thing that i realized you know when he, he uh delivered the film to have the, the the trailer uh finished is the james's disclosure 90 90 to 95 percent of the people this will be disclosure for them because they they don't know the stuff that you and I do or a lot of your listeners I they're see not what you're familiar mm -hmm. they're not familiar with any of it and uh, maybe they've heard the word Roswell maybe they heard about the tic tac but they you know they don't really know the ins and outs the popcorn munching crowds the thousands and thousands of people that are going to be sitting in that theater 90% of them are going to be getting a wake up call right major wake up call and i you know, people have been asking for disclosure. This is disclosure. It, everything will be different after this film. I, I, I mark my words on that. This is a huge, huge step forward for the subject. And I'll tell you, James deserves all the success and all the accolades he's going to get. But I, I keep warning him, saying, "Now you're going to be, you're going to be the the figurehead for the whole movement. So good luck with that." <laughs> yeah, everybody's going to. They're going to be calling you up every time there's a question, and and now, you know, with that with that New York Times article two years ago, and um, and the um, the Tic Tac, the Nimitz, uh, uh, you know, in the revelation of the uh, the advanced aerial threat uh, group and stuff. I mean, that really made it okay for the media to cover this stuff seriously. And if James had tried to finish this film two years ago and get it on the movie screens, he wouldn't have had a chance. I but think because, you're right. You're perfectly because right. Because yeah. subject, the subject is now mainstream, James is perfectly positioned and perfect timing to have a theatrical release. And I'm telling you, they're doing a 5.1 surround sound. There's a, a world-class composer who's doing all the music. Everything is color corrected. I mean, it's it's a real feature film. This is not just some, you know, yeah. episode you're going to see on uh, History Channel or something. This This is... This is the serious stuff. This is the, the big time. And uh, I am so proud of him and proud of everybody that was involved in this project. And I was very, very honored to be asked to help out. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. I just got to tell you a funny story. I was uh, texting with him the other day, and he was under his car <laughs> while he was texting. <laughs> uh, the guy never stops working. He's he's no. he's amazing. And uh, uh, But... Yeah, I wish that all this success. But you actually got to see the screener. You got you got to see the film. What was your reaction? I've seen the film a whole bunch of times. Um, 
like I said, there was footage in there that I'd never seen before. There are cases that he mentions that I'd never heard before. I've read hundreds of books on UFOs, hundreds. Uh, and, and I was, you know, it, it's just, it's put together so well and so professionally. Like I said, it doesn't matter how much you know about the field. There's something that's going to make you scratch your head and go, I didn't know that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think it's, um, I'm not a big ETH guy. I, as many people out there who know my work, know that I'm, um, I, I, I prefer to, um, you know, I, I've been saying this for years. Uh, we need to exhaust all mundane explanations and closed system explanations before we think we're important enough for anything out there to come here. Um, it's it just the way that these things manifest, the way that the aliens interact with us, the, all the different types of craft, all the different types of beings. It, 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 there's something tied into consciousness that's involved. It's closed system. I don't feel anything out there is coming here. Ray Stanford's the only one that convinces me that I might be wrong. Uh, his work is the only work that that is pulling me back towards the ETH. I'm a I'm a real um, I don't know. I, I'm an au contrarian. You know, I, I would rather think there's other tenants in our building uh, than uh, something out there thinking. Uh, that were important enough to come and, and keep gathering flowers and picking up rocks like they'd never seen them. And this is all theatrical. There's something being staged for us that's pulling us off planet. I think that it's a collective unconscious manifestation to pull us off planet. The planet itself may be co-creating these these events uh, along with our collective unconscious. Um, I'm in a much different place than uh, 99% of the people that think about this uh, subject. And uh, I I just, you know, but for all the people that think we're being visited by aliens, this this is your film. He doesn't come out and say that, <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's, it's hinted, it's hinted at all over the place. So, well, <laughs> which, that, which is cool. It's entertaining. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to love it. I can't wait to see, I'm going to be watching the crowd. I'm not going to be watching the screen. Yeah. I'll be watching how everybody's you know, responding to all this. It's going to be fun. It's we mark my words. This is going to be huge. And he does, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. James is one of the nicest, sweetest, biggest yeah. hearted people I've ever known. And uh, he and yeah. his wife, you know, Rebecca and his son, Ollie, are just incredible people. And man, I'll tell you, it just, all the work and effort. And he almost lost everything uh, during the process. It's just so, so cool that he's been able to, to get this thing put to bed. And I'm so proud of him. Wow. So you went out over towards Stenson Beach over there. Yeah. 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 I was in uh, Bolinas. Bolinas, right. And, uh, yep. Um, been there many times. Now, uh, I think it's interesting what you, you've just said, because one of the questions I ask a lot of my guests, and I just did last week, uh, Chris Rutowski, uh, Rutowski, uh, I asked him, um, you know, why would we be visited by an entail, uh, and if there's intelligent life out there, what makes us so special if there's possibly 40 billion, you know, Earth-like planets with uh, some type of life possibly in our galaxy? And I have to say, always possibly, because no one really knows. But what makes us so special why we're being visited? He said water. Water is unusual, but um, and that's probably one of the reasons why we'd be visited. But, uh, you yeah. know, there's a lot of questions out there. Uh, I, I don't know about the, the consciousness thing. He did actually mention that a lot of people are talking about that these days, uh, that it's uh, it could have an involvement with that. Um, I, I kind of, I, I like to just continue to say that I have no idea. <laughs> and, right. uh, and, and, you know. Uh, uh, well, I really don't. Don't, like I discussed on the show before, I'm an experiencer. I've been close enough to touch them. They are not human. They're they're uh, they're bipedal. They look kind of like us, but not really. Um, and um, they're real. It changed my life. I mean, I I'm a completely different person as a as a you know direct result of that experience when I was seven years old. Um, Can you talk so, about that again? Because a lot of people never remember won't remember that. Story. Yeah, growing up in Bellevue, Washington, I one night in the spring of '63, I I just you know, I was 
almost seven, just about a month away from my birthday. And uh, I woke up because there was a strange kind of light in my room, and it, it was these two foot tall glittering wands or spears, as I called them, that these little entities were holding um, around my bed. And um, the light would glitter up and down and was shining uh, enough residual light so I could see the, the figures. Not very well, but I could see that they were extremely skinny. I called them stick men with big heads. And uh, they literally followed me around my neighborhood at three in the morning. And uh, I was trying to go um, uh, call my parents so that they could come and, and save me and and, <laughs> and rescue me from these these little guys, there were three of them, possibly a fourth in the back, who was hiding. Excuse me, and um, they didn't walk. They 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 glide. They kind of glided. They all moved together like cattails. Um, they just kind of slid along above the ground. Uh, it was fairly terrifying. I, I went to two neighbors, tried to get them to answer the door at three in the morning and and call my parents. One of them actually did. I don't know what happened. I ended up five houses away. My sister, after an indeterminate amount of time, she said about 20 minutes. I think it may have been longer. Um, she was 18. I was six. She found me. Uh, I was absolutely terrified. Uh, she took me uh, into the house. Of course, I refused to go and <laughs> sleep in my bedroom. I was too afraid. And um, so she says, okay, well, you can sleep in, in the bed with me. And to just to give you an idea of how traumatized I was, in my sleep, I tried to nurse her. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, that's how freaked out I was. Um, my parents said you were, you know, it was, you were had a nightmare. You were sleepwalking. Um, when I ran out the kitchen door, I forgot my dad had put the screen door on. And I ran right into the screen door. And, you know, sorry, I uh, wasn't sleepwalking. <laughs> wow. And uh, it, it changed my life. I mean, I've been absolutely, you know, really interested in the subject ever since uh i hid my interest for a lot of years and um when i finally you know when i moved to colorado and all this stuff was flying around and everybody was seeing it i felt comfortable enough to come out and uh and talk about it and, and start investigating wow that is uh that's really quite the way to get started i do remember the story just not the details yeah. of it uh, i never saw a ship uh i was yelling at him why don't you you know say something talk to me what do you want what do you want they refused uh, or were unable uh to communicate with me i didn't have any telepathic communication i didn't have any any sort of you know indication at all that they of anything positive or negative they, they seem like bio robots or something uh, totally devoid of any sort of you know um any sort of expression or you know i kind of blanked out their faces i think i'm i bet you if i got regressed i'd probably remember a lot of stuff but um i i feel okay with the experience and i don't really <laughs> i don't want to open up pandora's box with that one it ever ever happened again Nope. Well, one time I had one thing that happened. It could have been, it could have been something. I have six hours of missing time in the middle of the southern Utah desert. That was uh, wow. that was a pretty interesting experience. Wow, that is, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, I am going to put the phone number up. Uh, so if anyone would like to call in, uh, you can see that uh, we have uh, race be over there screening the calls, and that number is eight five five four seven two. Five four eight three. Numbers up on the screen if you're on YouTube. Again, that number is eight five five four seven two five four eight three. And feel free to call in and ask our guest uh, a question. Uh, we're standing by. And so, um, you had that experience. You've seen a lot of things happen in Colorado. Um, in yeah. The, uh, have you had sightings elsewhere as well? Yes, yes, I have. My first sighting was uh, third week, uh, Friday of September, 1979. I was up in New Paltz, New York, with a group of friends. Uh, three of us were had gobbled mushrooms; the other three hadn't. Um, we all shared the same experience. Uh, there was absolutely no difference between the um, <laughs> the enhanced uh, experience and the regular conscious experience. Uh, 
It was um, a group of, of lights way up in the sky. They looked like stars. And um, we seemed to be in communication with them. We were creating, uh, uh, my brother said, let's, let's try an experiment. And so we made a square, laid down in the form of a square, and then we did a circle, we did a triangle, and the objects in the sky mirrored what we did, uh, which wow. was very strange. And then, then our ride came, and we, we left and went to the party. <laughs> oh. I was in college and having a good time. It was like, hey, you would never believe what just happened, you know. And that was my first sighting. Um, I had a really good sighting after I moved to Sedona. It looked like one of the Tic Tacs. It flew broad daylight, 3 o'clock. March 27th, uh, 2005, it flew right up uh, Oak Creek, uh, right through middle of town. Six other people uh, reported it. It seemed to be about 30 or 40 feet long. Um, was looked like a flying egg, maybe a little flattened. Uh, had it one end seemed to be a little bit more pointed than the other end, so it actually did look like an egg. Uh, no wings, no propulsion, no noise. Um, I caught a well good look at it for about i don't know seven seconds maybe eight seconds as it flew along before it you know my the, the house and some trees obscured the view but um that was uh, pretty interesting i've had some nighttime sightings there uh, including a, a sighting of two ar- big orange orbs that got chased away by air force jets oh wow i uh, love those wow yeah Hey, we got calls stacking up, so uh, okay, go we ahead. Also, get right into them. We have uh, Steve calling from Las Vegas. Steve, you're on the air. Steve, can you hear us? Uh, this happened last week, um, and I think it's. I'm going to have to put you back on hold, Steve. And uh, I was hoping this wouldn't happen again. Uh, so there's some type of issue over at uh, at the station. Um, we have uh, three calls on hold over there right now. Uh, let's try to see if we can get that figured out. And let me just try Steve one more time. Steve, you're on the air. Can you hear us? Okay, I can see that he's talking. Steve, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to put you back on hold. Um, all right, so we have a setting problem. We're going to wait for that, um, and we do have uh, we have a number of people on hold right now. Hopefully the setting will be uh, cleaned up and figured out over there at the radio station. But um, you might as well continue on with uh, your other sightings you had. I wouldn't know where to begin. I've had so many. Um, in Colorado, oh, it, I had as many as five in one day. Jeez. Um, well, it's great when you have a phone tree and you have people all over the valley. They call you up and say, "Quick, run outside! Look, you know, look to the south. Get up on your roof," <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. So, um, we're able to uh, alert each other, and um, we've been able to. I got some video uh, that way. Um, I had a really cool sighting on uh, December eighth, uh, ninety four, when uh, it was eight below out. It was uh, at night, around ten o'clock. And uh, we had a group of seven lights come in and a group of six. They both came in, joined, started milling around. They couldn't have been more than two miles from us. Uh, Didn't hear a thing. Thirteen objects, we didn't hear a thing. Uh, Some of them started blinking. Others stayed steady. Then they formed back up. One group went one way. The other group went another way. (laughs) Wow. And they, uh, they didn't hear a single sound. It was just deathly still. And I got uh, footage on night vision uh, with a night vision lens wow. uh, that was really, I've been holding on to that. Uh, I haven't uh, I haven't supplied it to any TV shows or anything. I have another really interesting triangle sighting that we got footage of too that uh, flew about a half a mile away from us in a complete circle uh, in an arc kind of around us. Um, that was a good one. Um, again, I mentioned the uh, the little scout ship. It flew about 50 feet off the road, and about 150 feet in front of us, and then zipped out over the uh, the Werfano Valley. And it looked um, like somebody, you know, when you reel in a lure really fast mm-hmm. in the water and it kind of skips. That's yeah. what it looked like it was doing in the atmosphere, like it was skipping. 
uh, in the atmosphere. That was pretty interesting. I actually was able to get uh, binoculars on it as it as it faded away uh, into the distance. It was pretty small. It was only about 12 feet, maybe 15 feet. And um, I've seen big rectangles. We've had uh, them block out the sky. I've seen every type of orb. Uh, we had a, a one of those little red ones that flew right next to our car um, outside of Fort Garland. My band was with me, and three of the guys had never had a sighting. Two of them had. Well, me and the other one had. And uh, and so they were all excited because they finally got to see something. <laughs> wow. And it was – I could have hit it with a rock. I mean, it was really close to us. Jeez. Um, we've had – oh, my God. All, whole groups of lights over Blanca Peak. Um had two big house-sized fireballs right at treetop level, go one after the other, all the way down the, the entire length of the valley. I was up about a thousand feet off the valley floor, so we had a really good, good view of those. Um, I had this one thing that went over that was probably some sort of military thing. It, it looked like the Millennium Falcon, uh, and had a big, super loud, and it had a. Uh, um, the whole back end seemed to be lit up a uh, blue flame uh, coming out of it. Um, but it was kind of flat and extremely loud. Jeez, um, I saw look like the space, space shuttle, shuttle with no with wings. No wings. And a whole bunch of people saw that. Um, I don't know, man. It's wow. just That's really amazing. Silver That's orbs. Amazing. I'm going to try a different color. See ya. Uh, see uh if that might work uh let's let's try uh let's try Check. let's try john over in missouri john can you hear us i can see john talking i can't hear john talking all right so uh, that's it i'm terribly sorry we have all these people on hold doesn't look like it's going to happen again um so um but i'm not going to give up uh, i will uh i will do what i did last week uh that that didn't go so well either <laughs> the skype uh, the skype call so uh we're just i want to and we've got another person calling in so we got four people on uh, all trying to call so i do apologize uh we may try we may try later um if uh if they can figure it out over the radio station what's going on it's really too bad uh um i don't dare to try skype so we're gonna pull the number off of right now and We'll just move on. Uh, wow. Uh, I've only had, I've had one a really interesting, uh, well, I thought it was an inter interesting sighting. And uh, I've had uh, another sighting that it probably was a sighting, but I've always discounted it. Um, and I don't, I've just been afraid to say that I've had more than one sighting. Maybe that's part of it. But another thing it's, you know, I thought for sure it was like the International Space Station or something like that. It was, uh, it it was big. It was uh, well lit up in the real distant night sky, but then it. What direction? Uh, let me think. It would be heading toward the east, sort of east. If I remember yeah, it was correctly. Yeah, probably the space station. What's that? It's pretty. It's pretty bright. The space station. Yeah. Yeah, it says. Um, and then it, uh, but it did a, a jag. <laughs> Or, that wasn't you know, the space station. Yeah. Or, you know, it could have been something atmospheric, possibly, but I, I don't really know. No. Uh, but I, I had I had a, a sighting that um, I almost had uh, the I, I could have seen the uh, the Phoenix Lights uh, ship uh, craft. But I was inside the motel, flew right over the motel. We were watching basketball and we heard other people outside. We couldn't hear what they were saying, but they were. We thought they were watching the game too. Arizona State, I think, was in the final or this Sweet 16 or something. And and then when we finally, you know, the noise really got loud outside. So we went out and they said, "Oh man, where have you been?" And this huge thing just flew over. I'm like, "What?" Because we saw on on TV they interrupted the game and there was that famous footage of the reporter standing there with the lights behind him. We saw that live. I was down in Casa Grande in a motel. <laughs> wow hey you know what yeah. i'm gonna you know what i'm gonna do chris um and i'm sorry this isn't really that fair to the people that were trying to call in and i apologize for that but uh, i happen to have ray's phone number right on skype because he's been on the show a number of times so i'm gonna okay. try, try to give ray stanford a call here because i know he's listening okay. 
and uh, we'll, okay. s- we'll see if that will work. Um, if not, of course, we'll just... Uh, Hello. S- Ray, is that you? Ray. That's me. Ray, I, I don't know if you even know this yet, but you're live on the air. How are you? <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I was sitting here thinking, since you can't get anybody that's calling in, call me. <laughs> well, and it I, worked. So... Your, your telepathy worked, because all of a sudden I thought, hey, I think I have Ray Stanford's number in my on my Skype. Because you've been on the show, and there you were. You popped right up when I looked. Well, I, I'm really glad that you did, and uh, it's always a pleasure to, to talk to, to Chris O'Brien. And, uh, hey, uh, I thought I would um, – he, he mentioned that I, I'm probably the only source of information that makes him uh, worry about um, accepting the extraterrestrial hypothesis. But, I, you know, I think that what we have to do in this field, if I may say so, is that um, – we need to not put that as the first priority as to where do they come from or even what are they here. We need to get the hard data that will communicate uh, some real uh, good science to us and uh, leave that perhaps to later. But I need right. to add this. One phenomenon, if I may. This is the so-called mothership phenomenon. It shouldn't seem strange or metaphysical or, or out of place, because after all, when we went our, took our first uh, from Earth journey to an extraterrestrial body, namely the moon, we had a mothership that stayed in orbit and sent the craft down to land on the moon and then came back up, docked with it, and came home. So the mothership phenomenon should not be surprising, but in the context of the question of, of extraterrestrial source, uh, it does not prove to us that it comes from Planet X or anything like that. But what this suggests, these huge objects releasing small objects of several different, uh, quite a number of different categories, is that they come from far away because the large object releasing small objects in the atmosphere suggests conservation of energy. And uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it makes a lot of sense. It, it tends us to interpret the extraterrestrial hypothesis but we don't know where they're coming from. They may need this big energy source if they're coming from an extra-dimensional situation that we can't comprehend. And when they get to the local place on the Earth, release shuttles to do some studies or whatever they're up to. But I'm doing all the talking, and I shouldn't do that. Hey, Chris, uh, uh, anything you care to, to say or, or ask me about or to discuss well, now? Yeah, and, and again, like I uh, mentioned uh, uh, earlier, um, that rationale makes perfect sense to me, and that is the only, uh, in, it, at least as far as you know, I'm aware. That is really the best evidence, circumstantial evidence that we have that would suggest that we are dealing with something off planet. Um, again, we can't really, uh, you know, factor anything in or out. And I absolutely agree with you that we need to exhaust all efforts. Uh, to utilize this wonderful technology that's now affordable, and instead of spending two million dollars on on Project Starlight, we can spend five thousand dollars and um, and have a, a a fairly good opportunity if if placed in a proper location uh, to get that kind of uh, hard data. And uh, um, I'm really um, again I really uh, can't can't emphasize enough how much of an inspiration uh, you have been for me in um, more ways than one and. And I really do uh, look forward to uh, finally getting some quality data that you can sink your teeth into. <laughs> well, listen, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, among the, and by the way, this is very exciting and, and very rewarding to me to see the kind of effort you're doing to get instruments out there and get data. And uh, <laughs> But I have a question. Uh, my question I'd ask you on the phone some time ago, but uh, it has to do with the magnetometer. Uh, the magnetometer we used is an extreme low frequency magnetometer, and uh, it came about because we had evidence that there was uh, extreme low frequency magnetism associated with these objects. I won't go into it now, but uh, uh, we very successfully used this during daylight filming of objects, and we have a direct correlation of the maneuvers with the changes in the extreme low frequency magnetic field. Now, that's ex- extremely important is to record in a way where you have a real-time signal to, to, to correlate uh, one thing with another uh, so that you can correlate field effects with the maneuvers. It tells you 
that something is happening. In this case, it strongly suggests, because of what we see on the film, it suggests that as, as a gross propulsive mechanism in the atmosphere, we are using, they're using uh, electrified atmosphere, plasma in other words, maneuvering with a magnetic field. This does not mean it's a, it's a primary, primary drive or anything of, of that nature. And it doesn't prove that their ET is contrast with something coming from somewhere else, but right. that in, in a realistic sense in the atmosphere. And, uh, but um, uh, do, in, your, in your magnetometer, do, can you tell me what, what type of bandwidth, what, uh, what frequency uh, this is monitoring on? The, the magnetic spectrum, as you know, is, is incredibly broad. Do you know what, uh, what range this is? is or is it just direct magnetism and not looking at frequencies, or, or what? Do you know? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and read you the specs on it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the website right now for the technical in information. Uh-oh. Um, again. <laughs> this could put people to yeah. sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it'll just take a second. Um, I have asked um, Ron about this, and um, he's um, – I think it's a full spectrum. It's not focused uh, only on the uh, low frequency. I think it is a full spectrum. See, that uh, th- th- that's kind of problematical because uh, you don't unless there's a way to tell what frequency you're looking at. It's very difficult to analyze it scientifically. I think though that there probably is an answer that's more meaningful than that. Uh, yeah. with, uh, Ron, I, I wish I wish Ron would contact me and, and talk about this because yeah. uh, it re- it really needs to be ironed out because when you go to present this to physical scientists uh, to try to gain physical theory, you need to know what it really is being monitored. And uh, let me mention some background. Uh, I believe that uh, the government, that the, the first reason that got the government very concerned about UFOs and secrecy was the effect of this extreme low frequency, which we have documented again and again with our system, uh, upon submarine communication, which communicates in the extreme low frequency range. And uh, in fact, it was a physicist uh, that works uh, uh, for the Navy that uh, was one of the two major designers of our system. Now, yeah, but uh, that's an acoustic. A, Isn't that an acoustic signal? No, no, not at all. No, that had nothing to do with acoustics. It has to do with extreme low frequency magnetism. And uh, okay. uh, this uh, a friend of mine uh, in, back in Austin that had been in the U.S. Navy uh, working uh, aboard a uh, nuclear submarine for a long time period. He said something that really got to him one night uh, happened. Uh, it was uh, uh, they were deep under the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, all of a sudden, the skipper came in on the uh, intercom and said, look, I'm requesting that we surface as quickly as is commensurate with safety. Uh, if we can do this as quickly as possible, safely, he said, I believe when we get to the surface, you guys are going to be able to see a UFO at close range. Well, they did it. They succeeded, and they got out on the deck, and here was a textbook disc UFO quite nearby. Now, he didn't have the guts to ask the skipper how they knew, but I would strongly suggest that he was monitoring the extreme low frequency communications of the submarine and saw a characteristic recognized disturbance. They'd had to deal with this disturbance apparently from back in the 40s. So you can see how it become a, a secret that these submarines that are so important to national defense are having a disturbance of something of these strange objects that could give a good reason to classify the whole UFO thing right away. And I think it was the beginning of secrecy in relationship to that. Not that they knew where it was coming from at that time or how it was being generated but simply that it was a problem to national security because of its effect on, on submarine communication. But in short, uh, Chris, if you can find that out, I'd, I'd love to know because uh, that, that is very much needed in the analysis of, uh, uh, in relationship to propulsion as to what uh, uh, frequencies we're dealing with. And uh, I think you'll find there's a simple answer to it uh, that Ron can give you, but uh, please get back to me on that. Yeah, it's a um, it's a 3D OF magnetometer, uh, and so it's uh, there's three. What well, you're talking about magna- manufacturer there, right? Uh, 3D OF. Uh, no, it's uh, a type of magnet. Uh, there's 3D never, OF, never... 6D OF, and 9D OF. Okay, I, I've never heard of that. Uh, of course, the system we use, 
well, is, is, is strictly uh, an E11. I don't know what that covers, but there should be a statement of, of, uh, of the, the bandwidth uh, from the standpoint of frequency, or you want to call it wavelength. Uh, yeah. There should be a statement there, and it should be, I would recommend once you learn it, that you, you publish it with the, the literature that's making this available to people so that right. they, they don't know what they're they're getting into it. It's extremely important. Uh, by the way, you mentioned uh, correlations, that replication in phenomena. Well, uh, I wish that I could talk some of the people that uh, that have strong scientific backgrounds to come here and see what I have. You you understand why. And uh, But the replication, we have films from airliners that have gotten in daylight multiple times and from the ground that show the exact same types of phenomenon, the same type of gigantic carriers, two, two classes of carriers, and the same types of triangular objects, and I can show them at least five distinct types that we have filmed on multiple occasions and that other people have actually photographed too, uh, including the, the so-called mothership. So it's not that Ray Stanford is here with his organization and claiming something that nobody else has gotten. We have excellent pictures of these so-called motherships with smaller objects from other sources that are highly credible. And uh, that, where, however you want to interpret it, at least suggests that they're conserving energy to get up here by, in some way that requires a, a lot of energy of this the big object if you're going to carry uh, shuttles down to Earth and maybe elsewhere <laughs> to, to do studies. So uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's my take on it, and, but I really am encouraged by your effort, and I, I wish you the best because if we can get these systems going around the world, uh, it's going to create a whole new ball game in this field. Chris, yeah, you know <laughs> I abs- absolutely agree, and and with the advent of the internet, um, the the connectivity and the sharing of information um, is also uh, you know down down the road. Once we start to get uh, some quality uh, information, it's very easy to get uh, to get other uh, people to analyze the data and get some peer review. Let yeah. me mention one thing very fast, because I know we're getting near the end of the program, and that is this. We have recorded in daylight, and it's very important to get as much data as you can in daylight imagery. Uh, we have recorded again and again multiple sets of very, very specific phenomena that these objects generate. Aircraft, meteors, uh, natural phenomena in the atmosphere, uh, nothing else creates these sets of phenomena, one of which is multiple images generated at high speed around the object in broad daylight. There are other really, truly wonderful and remarkable phenomena that, uh, that we've documented, and uh, uh, the effects on backlighting, the Faraday rings due to rotation of the, uh, the plane of polarization uh, uh, of, the, of the backlighting as it passes the object toward the camera. But as if we get these kind of phenomena and document them in other sources and can show this, Worldwide, as a phenomenon, it takes it out of the category of natural phenomena, even as when we, we uh, actually filmed and recorded the uh, gravity-like effects, as well as the uh, light spectra and the, uh, the images of objects on the edge of white sands when I got a tip that they were being plagued by these things. And by golly, um, there, was, there was spectra that these things were emitting that was one single wavelength of light, which explained... When people see these things, often they say, it was so pure, I don't understand. Well, in this case, it was pure. It was a very long red wavelength of light. But the remarkable thing beyond it being pure, such as no conventional aircraft would produce in its propulsion or in its lighting, was that there was line splitting. That single line was being split. And to get that, you have to have it generated in the presence of a strong electrical field or a strong magnetic field. And in this case, based on the evidence we have, we believe that both are present because we objects were clearly using magnetoplasma dynamic propulsion in the atmosphere. If anybody doesn't believe that, if you've got a scientific background, contact me and I'll give you the evidence. But I'm really hoping that, that you guys can help people to get this kind of data in broad daylight, and also, even at night, it might be best for, for spectra in daylight, unless they're awfully bright. But uh, uh, you haven't mentioned spectra, but it'd be nice if you could also incorporate yeah. uh, a specific spectrum. Uh, well, we're, yeah. we're out of time, I'm, I'm afraid, I have to say. But uh, thanks. My pleasure. Uh, glad to talk to you, Ray, as always. Always fun to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ray. Thank- all right. Thanks for, telling, uh, for calling me. Thanks a lot. Bye. All right. Good night. Uh, so uh, we are out of time. Uh, but I will tell people, you can go over to ufodap.com, that's ufodap.com, 
and check out what Chris is doing. Chris, uh, I want to thank you very much uh, for being on the show tonight. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. It's always fun. Always fun. Always good to talk to you. And you take care. All okay, right. you too. All right, everyone. So that is it for our show this evening. Um, next week, we will be back with Seth Breedlove. Um, he is a, a, a film producer. Um, I believe the uh, the movie coming out is called On the Trail of UFOs. And uh, he'll, be on, he'll be on next week. So tune in for that. And remember, everyone, to keep your eyes to the sky.